A data scientist could be somebody who takes personality scores and uses that to create insights about human cognition. A data scientist could also be somebody who tries to nudge you to buy those things that have been in your online shopping cart for the last three weeks. There's no one definition for data science. It's a giant topic that covers everything from machine learning to data management. One similarity between all data scientists though, which is our definition for data science, is somebody who makes sense of our complex world using the mountains of data that we generate every day. Data scientist is a pretty new category. I don't think it was really starting to get popular until 2010s around there in the tech world. And since then, it's huge. It's grown everywhere. Like everyone has heard of a data scientist. It's blending together different titles like data engineer, data analyst, machine learning engineer. And so you get this full stack of somebody who can take a problem, make hypotheses, collect data, and then generate insights and communicate those insights. This turns into this four or five point life cycle of a data science project. The one I'm showing you today is a five point cycle. I'm gonna get into all five of those steps so you understand what a data scientist actually does. Data scientists don't have to be involved with every single step, but they might. Step one, generating hypotheses. In the business setting, this looks like translating business problems into data problems. You have a hunch about something that could happen or guesses about the future, and that's going to be your hypothesis, your hunch, your prediction. It could be something super broad, like we can increase revenue by looking at personality data, or something super specific that you might find in an academic research paper. I'm gonna use the running example of a hypothesis that somebody's birth month affects their favorite season, fall, winter, spring, summer. Where do we start once we've generated our hypothesis? We start with step two, data. You need to collect data and you need to clean data. What does that mean? Say we have a customer base with an Excel spreadsheet of their name and their birth month. We send around a survey and we ask everybody, what's your favorite season? So now we have an Excel spreadsheet with birth month, name, and favorite season. We're able to go through and all of a sudden, start looking at the patterns in our hypothesis. Say you opened up this data set and some people put in their birth month as a number and others people put it as the word. You're gonna have to go through and standardize that because code requires standard formatting. So the month and the number, that's gonna conflict and make code a bit harder. So you go through and clean that up. You make everything the same formatting. Say some people just put in random stuff, then you're gonna delete those entries because you're not gonna be able to use those in your prediction. That is the cleaning process. This for me is probably the most frustrating process. It's tedious, you have to do a lot of work by hand, but a well clean data set is very valuable. Now say we get a data set from somebody else and they give it to us. We're gonna wanna know that data lineage. How did they collect the data? How did they clean the data? What assumptions and biases are caked into the data? If you only surveyed one subset, of a population, like say you only surveyed teenage boys that are age 17 or 18, that data cannot really generalize to a broader population. It's not really gonna be applicable to a grandma who's 70 years old. We might see different trends in the data, so you need to understand the assumptions and biases of your data collection are going to affect the scope and the strength of your data prediction in the end. We've got a nice collected and cleaned data set. We get to move on to step three, exploration. This is where you dive into your data, getting a feel for it. You start understanding, we have this many people, this many people like fall, this many people like summer, and we start to see trends here. It's basic stuff. We're doing descriptive stuff. We're not predicting in the exploration step. We're just trying to understand what we have. You start to see like, oh, pretty much most people like summer, but then there are random scatterings pretty evenly across all the other seasons. What can I do with that information? And you go back and you update your hypotheses. You might need to collect more data and you move on to exploration. Maybe during the exploration phase, you realize you also need location data to improve your predictions. Somebody from a very cold winter climate is not gonna like winter as much as they like summer, but somebody from a blistering hot climate like Phoenix, Arizona, is not gonna like summer as much as they like winter, just because it's more pleasant outside. So things like location might also have an effect and you need to update your hypotheses, maybe alter the data you have, and then return to the exploration step. 
During the exploration step, I'm going to generate new hypotheses that are going to inform step four, which is my predictive step. In the predictive step, that's where you start creating your meaningful insights based on the world around you and the data that you've collected. Here, what maybe hypotheses will generate an update to is we can predict somebody's favorite season given their favorite month. And it's gonna be split into possibly two categories. I'm just making this up just for an example, but say most people like summer and those that don't like summer are probably going to have a birthday during the month that's in that season. I have a fall birthday, I happen to like fall. And so that's going to fit within my hypotheses. And you go through and you use statistical methods, you use predictive methods, machine learning, linear regression, neural networks, whatever method works in this situation, which is going to be up to you. You have creative freedom here to figure out what works best, to confirm or deny these hypotheses. And in following, that'll generate insights that can help you communicate benefit to some stakeholder. That's gonna be step five. And it's also a very challenging step. Step five is interpret and communicate. What can we do with these predictive insights that we've generated? And who are they benefiting? What good is it to guess somebody's favorite season based on their birth month? I don't know. Say you have a candle company and this candle company happens to have all these seasonal goods, fall scented candles, winter scented candles, spring scented. I don't really know what that would smell like. Maybe like raindrops or something. I'd I'm sure some candle people will have raindrop scented candles, I guess. If you send targeted ads to the wrong people, you're going to be wasting your money. So instead, you have somebody's birth month. This person probably has a preference toward fall, which means they might like fall scented products better. You're going to have better spend of your ad budget by only sending targeted ads to those with fall birthdays for fall seasonal products. This will increase your company's profitability and the candle company gets to live another day. But say you're not the person that makes these ad decisions, that's where the communication part comes because you're going to have to tell somebody in marketing, hey, I know how to increase this profitability. Here's how it is. Like, let me apply this. And you're gonna have to show your case well enough and make it in a way so that they understand and then apply your results for the company. That could be the hardest part. People are tricky. People have different sets of knowledge. So you need to learn how to communicate difficult and challenging things in a simple and easy to understand way in order to be a good data scientist. What are some other applications of data science? There are too many to list in this video. I could just stand back and have a 12 hour live stream just listing out every possible data science application. It could be anything from healthcare, psychology to cooking all over the place. Take Netflix, for example. Netflix learns what you like and then recommends you more things that are similar to what you like or that you might like in the future. This increases your watch time of Netflix. It's also pleasant for you because you don't have to sift through their thousands of shows to find one thing you like. They'll just say, hey, you probably like this. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I do like it. Like, thank you. Save me time when I want to be watching something on the show rather than searching for something to watch. Another crazy thing that Netflix does is they have data whenever you stop watching a show. Like they have data for every time point that somebody has watched or not watched or skipped forward or started like re-watching. So they know what is a very watchable moment in a TV show. As a result, you can take those insights and send them to a production team and they're gonna start making more shows that are more grippy, that have more watch time, that are engaging to us just based off of those insights that data scientists can generate. Logistic companies are a huge hire of data scientists. If I'm sending trucks all over the United States or whatever country that you're in, I don't want to oversend trucks. I don't want to strand truckers anywhere. I don't want to be understaffed on a holiday when it happened to be my most profitable day. As a result, you're going to need data scientists to go through your past data and also make predictions about future data so you can have proper staffing and proper logistical routes. One of my friends is a data scientist for a logistics company, but he does one thing. He tracks those little pieces that semis can attach other semis to. So have you ever been on the highway and you see a semi carrying a different semi? Those attachment pieces are super expensive and it's his job to track this company's attachment pieces all over the US and make sure that they all get back to the central location so they don't lose those resources or money. That's his whole job. 
but he gets paid a full salary because he makes enough money for the company. It's really crazy what you can be doing as a data scientist and how you can contribute. If there is a system with data, it could be anything, sensor data, purchase history, watch time, anything that gets into ones and zeros of the computer, and there's a process to understand that data and generate meaningful insights from the data, it's fair to call that data science. And that's a place as a data scientist where you can be helpful and valuable. If doing something like that interests you, then there are lots of other reasons to become a data scientist. The first would be job availability. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts 36% growth in the number of data scientists that we have over the next 10 years in, in the United States. Most companies know they should be generating insights from their data, and so they're hiring people to do that for them. It just so happens that there's a shortage in qualified labor. You need to actually know how to do it in order to be valuable for the company or for yourself. Once you do know what you're doing, you can be earning a median salary of $120,000. I'm sure that goes up in a high cost of living area. And oftentimes you have very flexible work location. I have friends who work 30, some even 20 hours per week, fully remote for their full-time data science job. If you get your work done, then the company doesn't care. You're helping them and also doing your job. A lot of jobs require the four-year degree in computer science or data science or something related to that. The good thing about this field is you don't need that major. If you can program, if you understand how to translate real-world problems into data problems, then you can get a job. You have a few data science projects on your GitHub, perhaps, and then you can go show that to an employer and also get an interview just because they see that you're capable of doing data science, regardless of what your background is or your grades are. If you're able to do a good job with data scientists, then good opportunities will come your way. It's even possible to get a job without a degree, given you've learned how to code and you're qualified to answer the problems that they have at hand. I would be short-sighted if I didn't give reasons why you shouldn't learn data science. You're gonna have a lot of freedom. Oftentimes, data scientists are just left to be. They say, hey, like, help the company out, you kind of explore your own ways, propose different routes, and we'll approve them or not. And hopefully you're gonna generate value for the company. That leaves you as the data scientist and maybe the mentorship of your manager, something like that, to explore around with the data at hand, generate insights, and hopefully it helps the company out. That could be daunting, especially if you're new to data science. What if you encounter really hard problems, which you will. Coding is hard, data science is hard. That's part of the challenge, and some people love that, and some people hate that. If you're a person who hates that, data science is probably not for you. Another big frustration with the data scientists that I know is when they communicate their findings, the decision makers that they communicate it to don't listen to them. This isn't always the case, and it really depends on your company and the flexibility of the budget that your decision makers have. When I find an insight and I communicate that to someone, above me, and I'm certain about it, but they don't listen to me, that's something that's very frustrating. So as a data scientist, part of the challenge is communicating to them, but if there are shortcomings in your communication or with your boss's listening skills, perhaps, you might not feel heard and your ideas might not get recognized at the organizational level. That can be the plight of an entry-level data scientist. You just keep rolling the dice, generating insights, and hoping that some of them stick at the higher level. That's data science. It's a broad term referring to hundreds of different jobs, but in the end, most data scientists make sense of our complex world through the lens of data. As a data scientist, you could work in basically any industry, and the skills that you learn now are going to be valuable for years and years to come. If you're interested in learning the skills to become a data scientist, I'm starting a tutorial series on just that subject. The playlist will be linked in the description below. If you're interested in following along, subscribe, hit the bell notification button, give this video a like if you found it helpful, and also leave a comment if I left you with any questions or thoughts. Overall, I would recommend data science as a career option. Thanks for watching.